Larry King can. Lynching? Remember, this ain't just rustling. It's murder. Wait a minute, men. Don't let's go off half-cocked and do something we'll be sorry for. We want to act in a reasonable, legitimate manner, not like a lawless mob. <laughs> Don't you like excitement? Nothing particular against hanging a murder and rustler. It's just I like doing it in the dark. The hanging? Well, what have we done? With your permission, gentlemen, we'll wait until daylight. Aren't you even going to tell us what we're accused of? Rustling. Ever hear of it? Rustling. And murder. <laughs> Hi there guys, so we are back for another Westerns for Life podcast episode and uh, for this episode we will be talking about the Western, American Western of my choice, the Oxbow Incident, which is directed by William A. Hellman. It's a Western that was taken from a 1940 uh, novel that was made for an American Western uh, starring Henry Fonda. The plot. So the story is actually based in 1885 in Nevada, where two drifting cowboys walk into a, uh, local small-time uh, saloon, Gil Carter and Art Croft, played by Henry Fonda and Harry uh, Morgan. And while they are in there having a, uh, a, a drink, they hear the news that a local farmer has their cattle uh, robbed and gets brutally murdered. And then they kind of walk into this where the locals, uh, they kind of gather up a, uh, a posse, kind of like a misfit of mixed uh, characters where they kind of try to get this lynch mob uh, posse that's trying to look out for the rustlers that murdered the local uh, farmer named Kincaid. The characters. So, um, to the main uh, character in this movie, uh, Henry Fonda, who plays uh, Gil Carter, um, an early Henry Fonda uh, role. Guys, what did you think of uh, Gil Carter, played by Henry Fonda? Dan, um, I'm not a fan particularly of Henry Fonda, despite. Uh, quite an impressive filmography what I'm just looking through I mean he's not someone that I would purposely watch a film because his name's attached to it I mean my most favorite performance from him was something differently done in Once Upon a Time in the West Um, but in this film I mean for someone who's got top billing in this film and a film of only running 75 minutes I didn't think he was in it a great deal. I mean, a lot of the time as the film progresses, he becomes more of a background character, I felt, as a couple of bursts onto screen. But yeah, despite not being a favourite of mine, he's solid in the role, um, fairly believable, but I wouldn't look at him and think he's some kind of hardened cowboy. He just looks more to me like a um, cowboy who grafts for a living, let's say. Mm. But um, a performance that I can't pick holes in it. It's just for me nothing particularly really special. Yeah. And you, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I actually <clears throat> agree with you know some of the points that Dan brought up. Um, I do like Henry Fun. I don't mind him. Obviously, Once One Time in the West is for me also his best sort of role and yeah, the best movie. Obviously, he's appeared in as well. Uh, but he, yeah, it's not out of place in a western. He sort of. It's believable in, in a cowboy role, um, just not as a sort of hard and seasoned cowboy, as Dan pointed out. But yeah, for what he has to do in the film, and I do agree with also, you know, sort of later on towards the ending of the film or towards the middle section, you know, and up until the ending, he sort of becomes more of a background character. I do agree with that as well. Mm. Uh, however, yeah, whenever he is on screen, um, he does, you know, his, his job well. He's, you know, he's 
definitely a uh, respectable actor. He, he always, you know, comes across believable, whatever he is in. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind Henry Fonda, but this is not, I would say, as great as our as a as a lead in a in a western. Mm. I would say so. Yeah, how would you, Carlos? Yeah, I mean, I do like Henry Fonda, but um, going into this movie, I mean, I've seen this movie four times now. And it's quite obvious that this is early in his career, uh, Henry Fonda. I mean, the majority of uh, the 1930s, he was kind of struggling to really uh, get his foothold in, in major parts. And he was uh, a lot of the time a supporting actor. But it wasn't until the John Ford um, movie, The Grapes of Wrath, which he got like... Uh, the lead role in that and then from from that year 1940s onwards uh, then henry fonda started to uh get a lot more kind of leading uh performances but this is you know it's not great great henry fonda in in, in this role um, but at the same time it's good to see him early on his in his career obviously you know he developed into a big uh, actor, uh, an Academy Award winner, uh, in much towards the end of his career. But there are other Western performances I do prefer him. You know, my darling Clementine, um, Once Upon a Time in the West, um, clearly. But yeah, I mean, I thought it was it was a solid performance without being uh, breathtaking or you know, or, or great. But um, yeah, I mean, it's quite clearly that he he's the big name here, even though quite a lot of the time, like Dan says, he's a little bit in the background and he doesn't always come up with many great, great lines in, in this movie. Um, but yeah, solid without being a great or fantastic performance. And then we come on to the other his buddy in the movie, the other drifting cowboy, played by um, Harry Morgan, who plays Art Croft. And um, Dan, what did you think of uh, the character Art Croft? Again, much like Henry Fonda, felt more to me like uh, almost a subdued character. I mean, sometimes a voice of reason, mm. uh, but. I found, I found it, which we'll get into a little bit later, but a, a lot of a portion of the movie quite forgettable. And, I mean, he didn't really stand out to me, Art Croft. He's sort of, what's the right word, on his shoulder for much of the film, just maybe having a word in his ear. I mean, he pulls him out of a bar fight, which was yeah. pretty funny and pretty, I mean, for, for the time, even though you don't see it, it's pretty pretty graphic, I would have said. Um, but, but yeah, another performance where he's there, he does his job, but would I remember it? Probably not in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah. Yeah, probably uh, the same for me. Uh, again, I would agree there. Um, I do like like that opening scene where the two of them go into the bar and Henry Fonda has a little bar fight there. And uh, yeah, that's where I, fe I feel his, his, uh, his cowboy partner friend Sort of gets to shine more in that scene uh sort of pulls him out of the fight and i love the moment where he throws the uh, little bit of water over henry fonda's face so that he wakes up i thought that was pretty pretty funny um but yeah, other than that not a standout or memorable character as well uh, yeah a little bit the voice of reason at times but that's really all that he's there for i feel i feel uh yeah it's not a fully developed fleshed out sort of character so that's what i feel about him yeah, I mean, it is kind of really a supporting role and he doesn't really have a lot to say. I mean, obviously he comes into town side by side with uh, the Henry Fonda character of Gil uh, Carter. But a lot of the time he doesn't really, um, I totally agree with what Dan says. I mean, a lot of the lines, I probably wouldn't remember what he said. Um, he probably had a handful of lines in, in, in this movie. But, I mean, I must say in this movie, you do get a lot of kind of supporting um, acting roles where everybody has their little line or two or have their sort of 
seen all two because it is mainly, I mean, Henry Fond is, is clearly the main lead um, and is featured in, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of the scenes. But for the majority of the movie, you do have these other characters uh, coming in and coming out. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll get into uh, this kind of town posse that goes uh, and try and find the murdering uh, rustlers who killed the, the local farmer. And um, we'll briefly just touch through some of the uh, the posse that was kind of uh, led with uh, the other sort of joining in locals. Um, I think one of the main kind of leaders from that posse was uh, a character, Major Tetley, who was kind of dressed up in this cavalry uh, outfit played by Frank Conroy. Uh, Dan, what did you think of uh, Major Tetley? Yeah, as for the actor, um, I, I can't say I can place him in anything off the top mm. of my head, but as the part he plays as a major in this, I think he does it really well because he's the one character, I would say, throughout the majority of the film that you feel the most kind of negative emotion towards because he's just right horrible and, and and just there's no reasoning with him um and obviously we try not to give any spoilers here but i found the ending quite satisfying to yeah. to his character but i i think yeah kind of on reflection probably the most interesting character for the most part of the film up until the final sort of 20 minutes i thought it was a real solid job by him yeah, that's actually what I was uh, going to say about him. I, f I feel like he was sort of the most interesting character in the film. Um, so that the most to do and you definitely he was the only character to sort of had any sort of emotion towards for me. It's like, I hate this guy. I want him to get, you know, his comeuppance or just, you know, somebody needs to stop him and what he's doing. Um, yeah, I, I thought he played the part well. He was, uh, for me, probably the, the standout character in the, uh, in the film, uh, to be honest. But he uh, he played that part very well. So yeah, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think he was the most um, interesting part. Um, obviously, what makes you got to have two opposites, and obviously, there's quite a few opposites in this movie. But he is um, kind of like the front runner who kind of wants to form uh, this posse to look uh, for justice. And you know, kind of heads out this uh, lynch mob um, to find the actual uh, murderers, uh, the rustlers. Um, a bit like Dan, I kind of I did like uh, how his character um, ended in the movie. Um, but I also do find that his son, uh, who played uh, Gerard uh, Tetley. Again, completely uh, two opposites there where Major Tetley is kind of like uh, this kind of macho guy who's kind of really bullying his son to kind of come yeah. in on this uh, lynch mob. And um, his son, Gerard Tetley, played by William Effie, F. E., or he's kind of a little bit reluctant to kind of join in uh, th th this posse. And I do like a lot of the scenes between the father and son where one thinks this is right and the other one thinks this may be uh, kind of against the law. So I, I do like the interaction between those two uh, different characters, you know, between the major Tetley and the son. Um, and then we also have another character who kind of also with the major who heads out this posse. And that's the uh, deputy, um, yeah. Who also kind of, who kind of heads the um, the posse because the sh the local sheriff actually isn't uh, kind of there, and he's kind of uh, actually uh, he's away. investigating the Kincaid property, actually, isn't he? Yeah. He's actually investigating uh, the Kincaid uh, farmer, uh, the actual guy who is allegedly uh, murdered. Um, so again, this deputy kind of goes against the grain. He kind of sees it as his opportunity to kind of yeah. uh, show that he is the law 
even though illegally he shouldn't be kind of heading out this um, his own version of justice. So, Dan, what did you think of the uh, deputy role? Yeah, again, I mean, good role. Uh, it's one of them. I mean, I don't want to be too overly critical, but it's one of them that a day, two days after watching it, I've kind of, like, <laughs> forgot already. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I've said it and we're, I'm looking forward to getting into this bit because the sort of last 20 minutes is what makes this film. There are characters, much like the deputy, I do find very forgettable. Um, and if you were to ask me to quote a line from a character, <laughs> I would really struggle, especially yeah. the deputy. Yeah, yeah I can think of one. <laughs> yeah, yeah Dep Deputy Butch uh, Mapes was his name. Mm. Sorry, mm. Jeff? Uh, yeah, I, I can't think of a line that he said. That was sort of a memorable line as well. But um, again, it's it was a good part, and he played it well. Um, just sort of, you know, fit, fitted the role. Um, yeah, again, not the most interesting of characters, but um, I do like the fact that he's sort of already, you know, before we see him, he's it's sort of alluded to that this guy is no good because the old guy in town says, you know, when you go get the sheriff, make sure you don't get the deputy, make sure you get the sheriff. Yeah. Because everybody yeah. already knows that the deputy is sort of rogue. He doesn't really, um, well, he shouldn't really be a deputy, to be honest, because, yeah, he doesn't sort of follow the law by by, by the book of the law, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I like that aspect about him. But again, not the most interesting characters. And again, if, if you ask me in a week's time to uh, think about the film, he's not going to be a character I mentioned. It's like, oh, I remember that character in the film. So, yeah, yeah. not memorable. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not really memorable. I mean, I get the idea that they would need a couple of um, headstrong uh, sort of um, characters to lead the posse. The trouble is the major Tetley uh, character is quite a strong character that kind of heads out the posse that you don't really uh, get a chance or, or even the time to kind of get on board with this other character. But, you know, Butch, Deputy Mapes is kind of uh, more of a side character who just kind of agrees with what uh, the Major says that, you know, they must seek justice and find out the murderers. And he just kind of, uh, it's, it's kind of an opportunity where, you know, in a small, quiet town, um, something like this uh, has happened that he's, he's just happy to go on board and be happy to be involved in something as big as this um so yeah like i say it's, it's not a it's not a big part but you know he's, he's more kind of in the background role so now we go on to uh ladies of the west probably uh the brief main segment brief yeah. segment so we go on to uh, ladies of the west Women of the West. Where kind of the main female part in this, which is played by Jane Darwell, a former Academy Award winner. She won in the John Ford movie, The Grapes of Wrath, which is actually a movie starring Henry Fonda, which was made in 1940. Now, mm. she joins in, in with, with, with the local posse plays a character, Ma Jenny Greer. Um, Dan, what did you think of her? Now, this character is a memorable one. Yeah. Um, I, I was yeah. surprised when she, she saddled up, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> real loud enough, I can describe it as that TV show. I don't know why I kept jumping in my head. Imagine like Roseanne saddling up. You remember Roseanne? <laughs> oh, yeah. Roseanne, yeah, she does look a bit like him. Yeah. Yeah, she does. Roseanne, yeah, yeah, yeah. Roseanne Barr, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah this character was yeah. quite entertaining. Uh, I mean, she, she had a big mouth. You could all, you always knew of her presence. And um, yeah. yeah, she wasn't scared to take responsibility and obviously didn't care about repercussions. I thought she was entertaining, real, real solid performance, actually. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. Besides the uh, you know, Major Tetley character, she was another one that did stand out and uh, one that I might definitely remember if you ask me about the film in a few weeks' time. Um, 
actually wasn't thinking about you know the sort of resemblance to Roseanne, but as you pointed that out, I can totally see it. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about the uh, sort of the nasty woman part and uh, sudden impact with Clint Eastwood as well, where you have that sort of nasty uh, yeah, yeah, female yeah. character. I was sort of reminded of her a little bit. She had shades of her as well. Um, but yeah, I did like her. She had a she had a good part as, as well, and uh, yeah, she I, I think she definitely deserves a Women of the West segment, even if it is a brief one, because she's not sort of a, a love interest or whatever. But she is a standout, memorable character for sure. Unlike the other woman in this film, I'm just going to briefly, uh, in passing, mention because I do have a picture of her lined up. Uh, you know, the, the character of Rose, who Henry Fonda yeah. was supposed to marry in the film, but then turned out she married some other guy. Oh, I lost my neckerchief. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, she wasn't memorable at all, to be fair. She only had one scene. Uh, she was there, but I yeah, definitely prefer the, uh, the Jenny Greer character. Um, she was more standout in, in terms of the, of the female presence in the film. So that's what I think of her. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, she was known as Ma. I mean, she did have quite a bit of a look quite a bit of a butch look. I mean, there was nothing feminine or nice about no. her. <laughs> uh, yeah. and did have that kind of Roseanne look about her. I mean, yeah, I mean, she was quite gung-ho. I mean, again, you could probably, you know, in, in kind of like an order of the posse that kind of went, uh, that really wanted uh, to kind of seek out their own brand of justice. Obviously, you've got the major Tetley, um You've also got the deputy sheriff, who is literally quite gung ho in his approach. And then you've also got um, uh, Farnell, uh, a local friend um, of Kincaid, who actually joins in the posse as well. And also Ma, Jenny Greer. Um, they're kind of like the main, um, the, the main group that kind of form this posse. It's basically all the others, are literally just there. For the ride um i mean obviously you know you get the two cowboys uh that come along henry fonda and uh, harry morgan's uh characters uh they're kind of they they don't really need to sort of uh, be involved but they, they try to be the kind of middle um the middle grounded people where they're kind of no this is wrong um but they try to sort of uh, say this is, you know, they go, they kind of go kind of adventure where they, they kind of got to see that nothing uh, goes against the law, even though uh, they might be uh, in the minority of, of a lot of the actual decisions. So, yeah, I mean, Ma uh, played by uh, Jane um, Darwell. Uh, I mean, like I say, she's an Academy Award winner supporting uh, award-winning actress from the 1940s movie the grapes of wrath which is actually a john ford movie uh, starring with uh, henry fonda made a couple of years prior to this so yeah i mean when she does get uh, sort of uh, her lines in um she's heard i mean if, if you if if it's not sort of lines that she says she's often uh drinking and she, she's laughing out loud with uh, kind of like the town drunk who kind of joins in with the posse the town drunk is the guy who's kind of doing those rope um yeah sort of noose yeah. sort of uh images uh, yeah. which was quite quite a bit you know quite sickening you know for, for the time of uh, 1943 mm. when this movie was yeah. released so yeah i mean a few characters from the posse and uh, then we have the three suspected rustlers who eventually the posse, they do round up the three suspected uh, rustlers. Um, the main the main character is actually played by, by uh, Dana Andrews, who plays Donald Martin. He gets uh, a fair majority of, of the lines. Obviously the posse, when they do get hold of uh, these three suspected rustlers in, in that evening, in the dark, they do begin to uh, interrogate the three rustlers. So, Dan, what did you think of uh, Dana Andrews' uh, performance of uh, Donald Martin? This is where the film starts to actually grab my attention. Um, 
for the kind of what was 30 minutes possibly i think he yeah. is overall the best part of the film despite the major being the most interesting character and then you really feel for this this character all three of the accused actually and um this is where i thought right you know this is actually where the, why this film is regarded you know number of western movie lists you look at oxbow incidents quite high up it for me for the first 45 minutes definitely not but for kind of the incident uh, which unravels i think you know this character really is one that really makes you feel some emotion finally um you know for, for the accused not to basically get hung no spoilers how about you jeff um yeah actually weird that that's definitely the most interesting part of the film where they actually where we have the titular sort of incident at the augsburg and actually that whole sort of where they sort of interrogate the guys and um you know sort of decide well are they guilty or innocent that all sort of reminded me of the opening scene in hang em high with clint eastwood i think there was definitely homage paid to augsburg incident yeah, with yeah. that because there, there's a lot of similarity I, I was reminded a lot of, of hang em high uh, during those scenes, um, as for the character, the, the main accused one, he actually, yeah, he gets the most sort of uh, emotional depth of, of of a character because yeah, he writes that sort of, sort of, you know, not to get too spoilery, sort of writes that very emotional sort of letter, which gets read out, you know, towards the end of the film or in the literally in the final few minutes of the film. Um, so yeah, I like this character again. He was somebody you rooted for. You sort of believed he was innocent again. Um, you're only innocent until proven guilty. Um, mm. So we didn't really have any any evidence, um, really. I mean, the evidence was sort of stacked against them at, at one point, but I was still like, well, there's no way these guys did it. Obviously, again, not to get too spoilery, but, you know, it turns out that, you know, yeah. <laughs> something isn't the case as it, as it is presented in the film, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, I liked the character, and I liked uh, the actor. He did a good part. So he, he, uh, did a very good job in the in, in the role. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I think he. Um, I mean, Dana Andrews. I mean, I, I thought he had the best emotional scenes. I, I do like yeah. some of the scenes where he's actually he's actually the main guy who's pleading his innocence in his case, even though uh, the so-called evidence and his story uh, of the free is not really backed up up quite well. He is really the only one who's really uh, fighting, you know, to stay alive. Obviously, you know, the other, you have a Mexican in uh, there who supposedly can't speak English. And also you get <laughs> his, his so-called father, who I think he might have just called him father, or he was a little bit insane. Um, yeah. So nothing, no common sense is really coming out of the old guy. But, um, I mean, Donald Martin, the character, was really pleading his case quite a bit and I kind of felt really sad for him uh, in, in some of uh, in some of the the, the scenes in, in, into the story because uh, obviously he does say that he's a family man yeah. and you know he's he's married and he has kids um, but you know the majority of the posse really literally have they don't really want to hear this they're kind of most of them are kind of decided that the three guys that they've captured are guilty as anything. Guilty. So, yeah. you know, Dana Andrews played a significant part uh, to this movie. Um, I mean, yeah, probably the second most important character in the movie for me. Yeah. And, um, and then we go on to Anthony Quinn, who plays the Mexican Juan Martinez, uh, who... Um, legendary actor twice award uh, academy award winning uh, actor for winning the best support in uh, acting roles in uh, viva Zapata, a western in the 1950s and another movie in the 1950s as well um yeah an early role for anthony quinn um for the majority of of, of the movie he, he kind of makes out that he can't speak english uh, but then eventually he, he gets found out that he does understand english and speaks uh, english dan what did you think of uh, anthony quinn's performance of the mexican or juan martinez 
firstly, I really like Anthony Quinn anyway. Mm. And the little kind of verbal screen time he has, like the camera actually solely on him, I definitely finish this movie wanting to see more of him. I mean, there's one particular scene where he uses a, a knife to get a yeah. bullet out of his shin or calf, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, you can definitely see this character is an interesting character and he's one that I almost think out of the takeaway from the film, it'd be an interesting character to have a film of his own. I think he just looks like a kind of no-nonsense knife throwing gunslinger who um yeah i think anthony quinn the little time he had brought the character to life and made him believable yeah yeah definitely another another highlight for me as well i do love anthony quinn a lot i mean no matter the film he pops up in even if it's a, it's a small role in a film like this one admittedly is or or if it's a big part if he's sort of a main lead he's always a joy to watch i do love anthony quinn um He's done so many, you know, legendary films, of course, over the course of his long career. Um, too many, too many in the name right now, to be fair. But um, yeah, I love Anthony Quinn. I love his character. I wish there was more of him, indeed, because yeah, when, when he does get sort of his spotlight, you're like, oh, I want more of this guy. And definitely would have been interesting if there was a sort of a prequel to this film where you saw more of his character before the events of this film. He definitely feels like a character that deserves a film of, of, of its own. Um, yeah, uh, nothing really bad to say about him besides the fact that I wanted, you know, a bit more of him. But then again, you know, it's a, it's a big movie with a lot of big, you know, a bit, and sort of an ensemble movies, big characters. Um, of course, you know, they have to put spotlight on different characters to sort of tell the story. But I do like Anthony Quinn. It's, uh, he's definitely another standout and, and another, uh, and another highlight <laughs> of the film for me. Yeah, I mean, look, look you guys love Anthony Quinn. Um... I do say the majority of his movies from his career are movies from the 50s onwards. Um, and watching this movie for the first time, I think four years back, um, it was nice to see him quite early on in his career. And um, one of the highlights of the movie, obviously, is seeing Anthony Quinn and Henry Fonda, you know, two legendary actors in a movie, uh, let alone a Western. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree, like both of you, uh, it would have been nice to see him uh, a little bit more in this movie. Uh, I mean, first time when I saw it, when he was actually talking Spanish, and I thought, you know, this is Anthony mm -hmm. Quinn. I mean, surely he's going to start speaking English, which he does eventually. But, I mean, obviously, you know, had he been uh, the great actor, like he you know, became from the 1950s onwards, I'm pretty sure he would have had a lot more dialogue into this movie um, that was made in 1943 for sure. But I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, kind of a, a highlight to the movie having Anthony Quinn because it kind of does make it a bit more of a star-studded uh, movie uh, with Henry Fonda having the two of them in a movie together. I think they were in a movie together a couple of times uh, hmm. after this. But uh, yeah, I mean, Anthony Quinn, a uh, great career, a great actor. Um, so yeah, that I, they are probably the main characters, the two cowboys, uh, the main uh, yeah. posse characters, as well as uh, two of the three uh, suspected uh, rustlers. Behind the camera. Okay, so now we go to Behind the Camera, the uh, director. And the movie was directed by Mr. William A. Wellman, um, who more known uh, is known for directing the gangster classic in the 1930s, starring James Cagney, The Public Enemy. Public Enemy. And also, and also he was uh, the award winning director who won the Best Picture Award, in the very first Academy Awards in 1927 for a movie called Wings. Dan, what did you think of uh, the director for this movie? Yes, yeah, so going into this movie, I kind of realised that he was a big deal of a director back 
kind of you know fifties and, and and before. Um, but yeah, other than the two films you've pointed out, I mean, I do need to get into some James Cagney movies, and I have seen Wings, which is available on the Eureka label. That you know, granted for the time it was well deserved of an Oscar, but not a film that I would necessarily have in the collection. But this particular film, you know, I thought it was. Say, I'm not we'll get into it a little bit later. I'm not really a fan of this western for the most part, but. You can't fault kind of the direction of it. I mean, for what to me visibly looks like a studio shoot. I mean, you mm. can especially hear that from, you know, where they're supposed to be at the Oxbow. I mean, it, it's it's carried off quite well. But in terms of, you know, comparable Westerns, I wouldn't say it is outstanding. It's just decent. So I think it's a decent job. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. Actually, it's uh, again before I, uh, you know, before we started recording, I said to Carlos, I did skim over his sort of filmography on IMDb. Didn't really recognize too much, too much until Carlos said, "Well, he directed the Public Enemy," and so I must have missed that in this, uh, in this you know, movie list. Um, well, yeah, that's the only other film I've seen of this director as well is, is the Public Enemy, um, which that was a good film, well directed. With this film. Um, I would say it's serviceable, serviceable the direction. Uh, or some nice shots in there. The only sort of shot that really stood out for me um, that I thought was well directed, maybe it was intentional. At first, I thought it must be a framing mistake, but it's at the end when Henry Fonda's reading out the letter and sort of a two shot between you know his, his partner and, and, and Henry Fonda. And you sort of have the head of one guy blocking Henry Fonda's face as he's reading it in the, in the two shot. I thought that was inter a really interesting shot. Again, I don't know if it was intentional to frame it that way. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was yeah. intentional, yeah. Or maybe it was a mistake, but yeah, it definitely yeah. Yeah, makes more sense yeah, if it was intentional. It, it, it was intentional. Because when I first watched it, I was like, what, why are we not seeing his face? But I think I mm. get it's sort of to hide his emotion, I guess. Uh, yeah. So that's a, that's a cool shot. I did really like that shot in, yeah. uh, in the film. Other than that, not too many sort of shots that, that stand out. It's like Dan pointed out, you can obviously tell it's studio work um, that they shot yeah. on, on, on a backlot studio. Um, but yeah, serviceable, serviceable job for the, uh, for the director in this case for me. Yeah, I mean, it's quite noticeable. Obviously, I mean, the movie The Public Enemy is a gangster movie classic, uh, an essential one. Um, he done well. In, in a lot of the shots you do you do you do get a studio feel uh, for this movie and in a way this movie it's kind of like a movie that kind of be could be done as a play because you do get mm -hmm. a lot of acting pieces it's not a kind of shoot em up western so let's get that crystal clear this is kind yeah. of more story uh based character driven and it's mainly the bulk of the movie is the posse trying to brand out their own version of justice. Are these guys, these three guys that they've captured, are they are they guilty? And obviously, uh, the captured uh, rustlers, they're obviously pleading their case that they're innocent. So it is, you know, it's not a long movie, it's 75 minutes. It is a it's movie very short. Main, yeah. Yeah. And you know the running time is is perfect because it is base. It's a movie with a lot of dialogue. There's no action pieces uh, in this movie. It's not your normal western. Yeah. Um, so he's done well on that. I mean, it's a story that, to be honest, could have used any other kind of movie scenario, even to the scenarios of today. Um, so it's not your normal Western. I think he, he, he done a good job on that. I do like the story into this because it's quite dark. Um, it's quite a dark story for, for a movie of that time in the 1940s, which obviously, like Dan says, the main sort of last 20 minutes kind of has you thinking. And, uh, you know, it might have an effect on the viewer, whether they're kind of shocked and they feel numb in watching. But I thought, you know, this he done really well, William A. Uh, Wellman. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I know he's, I mean, I don't claim to be an expert 
in the golden age of cinema, you know, movies from the 30s and 40s, which are my two weakest uh, decades. But this is a well shot movie for the budget that they had. I mean, it was, it, although, it, although it was critically uh, acclaimed box office wise, it didn't do that well. But um, I thought it's a well directed movie. The music. On to the next uh, section, which is the music and the soundtrack um, that was involved in this movie. Dan, what did you think of the theme and some of the music choices for this movie? Yeah, again, like I've said in in previous videos, we've done this. It's not going to be a soundtrack I I would buy or even listen to on the like the likes of Spotify uh it's it's there it's prominent it fits the film um could i tell you composed it no yeah. um but it's one of them like much of the golden era of westerns it's more uh oh, the word i'm looking for okay more like an orchestra type music that's mm. the one yeah i don't feel i can get that word out at the moment <laughs> yeah um <laughs> But yeah, it, it it fits the movie for its time. It'd be well out of place in a in a much later yeah. western. So for yeah. anyone going into it, expect music really of the time. Yeah, which a lot of westerns did use. Yeah, I would yeah. agree with that. I've actually just quickly looked up with it, the music. It's apparently composed by I'm going to probably mispronounce this Cyril J. Mockridge. So that's uh, Cyril with a with a C. Yeah, I'd be able to tell you what other films. He done, he done the music for, uh, but again, I, I agree with Dan. The music works for the film in terms of the, uh, you know, the context of the film. Again, it's not one that I would listen to as well outside of the film. Uh, it's certainly not any Morricone score. Let's uh, let's put it that way. Um, but yeah, definitely of the time orchestral. Uh, it's it's one of those big orchestral sort of scores that you would get um, for films of the time. Even though there's a few more sort of quiet tracks as well, sort of more downbeat tracks, I guess, in the film. They do work for the film again. I would be more inclined, honestly, to buy the open range soundtrack, which I thought was more memorable than this one, which we covered, mm. of course, in the last uh, episode. Um, but yeah, music was serviceable for the film. Uh, again, just, just like the direction and most of the actors, it just really, it worked within the context of the film for me. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got to be honest, I, I kind of liked it. I mean, when the movie started, it's kind of in your face, it's loud. Yeah. And you know, you see the grey clouds, so you, you you immediately know that this is going to become a dark movie. But then, <clears throat> just as the first kind of scene gets shown, the music kind of he dials it right down, and it kind of goes a little bit more softer as the, they kind of ease into the first scene. So I'm not saying I'm going to buy the you know the theme or anything, but I thought it, it, it done its job. Uh, but I do get the fact that what Dan says, a theme and, and, and track tune or whatever you want to call it, if it gets played uh, in a modern day movie, would look completely outdated. But for its time, yeah. I thought it, it done it done it done its job for, for for the movie for sure. So yeah, that's the, the soundtrack and the music. favorite scenes and now we go on to kind of our favorite scenes favorite where scenes. yeah we'll pick one scene each between the three of us dan yeah so for me as say the last 20 minutes got um really quite gripping and i thought i had my favorite scene nailed on until the bar scene starts and it's just very subdued and you can again it's what i'm going to say it's, it's not a spoiler but the remorse and regret on the posse's face you can really see that and i mean that scene uh, and what follows before that hits quite hard actually and it, it really kind of knocks up this film's rating which i'll give give a bit later on but yeah the bar scene for me is uh quite quite something mm. but 
there's sort of in a space of 10 minutes quite easily two or three scenes that could have picked but i'll just go with that one yeah i was uh probably gonna <laughs> pick one of the scenes sort of from, from the finale uh without you know spoiling too much of course so instead as i has obviously been chosen i'm gonna i'm gonna pick something else i'm gonna pick the opening scene in the in the bar where you have the little bar fight and where we sort of establish henry fonda's scout and also as uh as partner slash slash friend um which yeah again there was a little humorous as well it was the right amount of comedy within that scene where henry fonda mm -hmm. just knocks that guy out in, in one sort of punch and he keeps punching and the, the bartender sort of comes up with a bottle and bang over the head of uh, <laughs> of henry fonda which when that happened the first time I, I was really laughing out i was like that was a pretty cool effect with the bottle there um so i like that and yeah then splashing the water in his face to wake him up and he's like uh did, did he did he come at me with uh with his fist no he used a bottle oh well that's good then <laughs> yeah sort of the reply afterwards uh that was my terrible and fun impression by the way um but yeah no i uh that scene would probably you know again aside from some of the scenes in the finale or the scenes where they sort of question the, the alleged suspects uh, that would probably be my my runner-up favorite scene. It's like I like the whole introduction scene with Henry Fonda in, in the uh, in the saloon. Yeah, I mean, it's I think for anyone who's seen uh, the Oxbow incident, I think probably the most talked about scene would be the bar scene, and without going into deep uh, sort of spoiler territory, and and I get that why people would talk. Yes, you could say that is the most talked about scene uh, in the movie me personally the scene that really got me uh more was kind of uh major tetley's uh mm. uh the character of major tetley and the son uh, gerard uh, tetley who was kind of like a kind of reluctant bystander into when they were interrogating the suspects and you know he was very reluctant to actually going on and joining with the posse to look for these uh, so-called murderers. But when those two guys uh, go back into town, uh, the guilt is really shown on the face of Major Tetley, uh, which he doesn't really want to show uh, any remorse uh, or let his son kind of see that. Um, again, without going into spoiler territory, uh, the ending scenes between the two of them really did make uh, quite a bit of the movie for me because I found that a lot of the scenes between the two of them as um, major, kind of major part uh, for me in viewing this movie and why I like it to a certain extent. So I'd probably say the last couple of scenes with, with those two characters uh, is my favorite scene in the movie. Also, I do like the scene where they're kind of voting, where they have that mm. voting uh, scene where yeah. are the suspects guilty? Uh, I thought that's quite a harrowing scene and kind of... Uh, kind yeah, of, should they get a trial or should we hang them? Yeah, yeah, it was quite a sickening scene to see that. And obviously, you see the people lined up as they kind of step forward or they put their, their arm up, whether they think the three suspects are guilty or not. Um, that had a good effect in that being filmed in black and white. I don't think it would have looked as good if it was done in, in daylight. So that, that was a pretty good scene, in, in my opinion. The Review Roundup. Okay, so the next section is actually the uh, movie roundup. Uh, the good points and bad points and our rating, what worked for the, in the movie and what didn't. Dan? Right, so this is a very tough one for me because um, I watched this film when it was originally released from Arrow Academy and quite enjoyed it, but then having said that, I didn't remember much about it. So revisiting it a couple of nights ago, I had to turn it off, so I was bored. I turned it off at 25 minutes put a different film on, then I cut, come back, turn it off again, about 40 minutes. And I thought, I've got to stick with it, I've got to review it. And then kind of 45 minutes pass, and then the film really grips you. 
when they find the suspects. And I thought, right, it's, it's got me now. And uh, it really does put you through the emotion of feeling for the suspects and hating certain characters. And it is really quite shocking what happens. And then I have to put myself in a place of when this film come out, kind of the impact it would have had something quite different for that time. Um, quite hard hitting. So my kind of rating of it went from a bang average five and I've notched it up to six out of 10 cowboy hats for this. And what I'd say to anyone watching it is do stick with it. Don't expect anything particularly exciting for a large portion of the film. But when kind of that final third happens, it really does grip you and it's really worth watching for that. It's not, you, I can't just say, you know, watch the final 20, 25 minutes of the films. It wouldn't work. So you have to have some appreciation for what comes before it. Yeah, you have to put it in I, context. Yeah. 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 I do completely disagree with the very high critical acclaim of this film of an eight when you look at many Western great lists mm. and it's really high up. I just, I struggle to put it there. I mean, you know, there's many Westerns that surpass this. I mean, other than that final sort of third of the film, um, I, thought, I find most of it really forgettable. But i say it's worth giving it a go. I think Carlos put it really well. It would serve really well as a stage play. But, um, yeah. yeah, six out of ten, it's, it's worth the watch for that final third. Yeah, that's something that I was actually going to bring up as well. It's like the story sort of, it feels like it's made more for, you know, for stage production. Uh, I think it would be interesting to watch a uh, sort of stage play of it, a version of it. Um, yeah, film overall, again, I get that, you know, back in the 40s when it came out, it might have had a sort of, you know, cultural impact uh, in the guys and people were talking about it and talking about, you know, the pros and cons of, you know, as I say, frontier justice. Um or maybe even vigilantism, you know, of course, was a could be a talking point about it. So I get, you know, for in the time when it was released, that it was, you know, a, a big sort of thing. If my dog will just leave me alone for a few seconds. Um, <laughs> I get for the time it was a big thing, a sort of a debatable film. Uh, where it, it got people talking. However, I think it's a case of a film that worked well back when it came out, but hasn't necessarily aged well for you know, today and for... Um, for today's audience i mean not in the sense that there's you know like blackface or whatever none of that stuff in there but i'm just talking about sort of thematically the film uh, as a whole uh, and so sort of i mean it is a short film you know only 75 minutes it's it's a damn short <coughs> film um mm. but i just feel it's it's one of those talky westerns i guess people would say that might not sort of grip the younger audiences or the, or, or, or the uh the audience of today however i would still say it's worth a watch for sure uh for the sort of historical you know importance and, and and cultural importance of it from back in the day but final rating for it i uh, i'm gonna go with six and a half um cowboy hats for me personally that's probably yeah that's the rating i would give it um was debating myself if i was going to give it five five and a half but i was like no it's it should oh, okay. be a little bit more because it is a again for the time it was an important film uh it did make money and stuff so i didn't want to sort of uh slide the film you know for that so anyway that's sort of my uh overall take on it. i like the actors in it again i wish some of the actors like henry fonda and uh, uh anthony <coughs> would have had a little bit more to do that they wouldn't sort of be more in the background but again i get it. it's an ensemble film it focuses on, on a lot of characters so i mean it's it's a decent film i definitely recommend it uh again with the caveat of you know it might be a little too slow and sort of quote unquote boring for most of the modern audiences so that'll be my take on it carlos yeah i mean so yeah let's break it down good points and bad points um the good points for this uh, it's great watching a young early performance from Henry Fonda and Anthony Quinn. So if anyone likes seeing those two guys acting, uh, it's, it's worth that. I do like the dark story in the movie. Um, it's not generally, I wouldn't really class this as a Western. I mean, it's not your normal Western for sure. Like I did say, it's a kind of a scenario where you could use any could use any type of 
movie genre and, and put this in obviously you know the lynch mob mentality uh you know the vigilante theme uh you know taking law into your own hands is, is the main talking point of the movie whether these guys are innocent or not um so it being quite dark i do like that it's, it's been used in 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 a western setting i mean i'm not saying it's the greatest western i mean i, I certainly wouldn't put it in the top 50 uh greatest westerns mm. of all time uh yeah. it's worth a watch i mean there are i mean the, the pacing of it is 75 minutes um it's it's about right because it is uh, quite heavy on dialogue there's not a lot of action pieces in in, in this it, to be honest not if uh, there's not hardly any yeah but it does kick into the second third of the movie when uh, the posse grab hold of uh, the so-called uh, suspects and it really does kick in uh, i mean some of the bad points i'm not really a fan of uh, movies where some of the important scenes are not always shown um, mm. you know a couple of vital key moments uh, it's kind of done off camera i mean that could still be done not showing certain faces and, and you know and certain sort of characters or what you think um should be should be seen or or anything like that but um yeah i mean it, it's it, it's a worthwhile watch uh, at the same time we also got to remember this is one of uh, actually it's just a, a favor of clint eastwood uh, so that was another mm. reason why i wanted to watch it uh, you know, about four years back, even though I'd heard of the movie, uh, it's also been uh, not. It was actually nominated for Best Picture in mm. 1943, losing out to uh, Casablanca. So you know, this movie was well known uh, back then. But I do get what Dan says. A movie like like this would be totally outdated. It probably wouldn't grab a casual Western fan, but. Yeah at the same time i do think it's a worthwhile watch and um, i'm going to give it a seven star rating out of ten uh, it certainly grabbed my attention it's not a movie i could watch um you know every year but it's a worthwhile uh, western and you know the dark theme to it i, I did enjoy um so yeah, we've done our rating for all the movies. Uh, this movie, The Oxbow Incident, is uh, pretty easy to get hold of. I mean, I've got the UK Arrow release. Oh, yeah, that's that's all alternate cover. Oh yeah, got the alternate cover, and Dan show that again. Uh, there we go. Yeah, Jeff. That's a pretty cool cover, actually. And yeah, for me, for myself, I have. Um, the German uh, Koch Media sort of veggie veggie book yeah. veggie pack edition of it, uh, the yeah. original poster cover on the front. Uh, and when you open it up, there's a disc yeah. and a little bit of a uh, of a booklet. It's all in German, sadly, of course, for you guys. But yeah, oh, uh, that's nice. Do get some cool pictures and stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, my copy of it, the Augsburg incident, the Koch Media. It is also brewery. available. It is also available in the U.S. on the Kino Lorber release i think they probably might use the original artwork like arrow video used so it's quite an easy and affordable uh, one to get hold of i mean this one does have a the arrow uk release does have a good henry fonda documentary of his career which oh, i yeah. thought that was quite interesting mm. it's kind of like a uh, start to end uh, um talk about his career and he talks about him winning uh, the oscar in his last movie on gone on the uh, golden pond so yeah that wraps up our review of the oxbow incident but uh dan uh, has the next choice which he will reveal what is our going to be going uh, what's going to be happening in our next episode review yes so for our next episode we'll be talking about the 1967 spaghetti western starring a legendary lee van cleef um, which we're looking forward to revisiting and talking about this one. Nice. There it is right there. I have the same arrow 
copy of it. Definitely an episode I'll be looking forward to because it's it's one of my personal favorites of Lee Van Cleef. But, uh, but not to get too far ahead, that's coming up in the next episode. And uh, <clears throat> before we sort of bring it to Carlos to uh, to end the uh, the episode, uh, let me just again quickly remind everybody that uh, the Westerns for Life podcast can be found not only on YouTube but also on uh, platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, any any place that you can find your podcasts. And with that, uh, Carlos, why don't you lead us out on this one? So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the episode uh, of the Oxbow incident. And um, yeah, stay tuned for the next one, which we'll be talking about the uh, 1967 Spaghetti Western Day of Anger. So, guys, till the next episode. Westerns for life, amigos. Westerns for life. Take See you care. in the next one. My dear wife, Mr. Davies will tell you what's happening here tonight. He's a good man and has done everything he can for me. I suppose there's some other good men here too, only they don't seem to realize what they're doing. They're the ones I feel sorry for. These fellows will go a long way to get the guy to kill Larry Kincaid. Lynch him? Remember, this ain't just rustling, it's murder. Wait a minute, men. Don't let's go off half-cocked and do something we'll be sorry for. We want to act in a reasonable, legitimate manner, not like a lawless mob. <laughs> Don't you like excitement? Nothing particular against hanging a murder and rustler. It's just I don't like doing it in the dark. The hanging? Well, what have we done? With your permission, gentlemen, we'll wait until daylight. Aren't you even going to tell us what we're accused of? Rustling. Ever hear of it? Rustling. And murder. Murder. You got any doubts, Teddy? I say let's call off this party. This is only slightly any of your business, my friend. Remember that? Hangin's any man's business that's around. Well, even in this godforsaken country, I've got a right to a trial. You're getting a trial. The 28 are the only kind of judges murderers and rustlers get it in what you call this godforsaken country. So far, the jury don't like your story. I sure wish we was well out of this here business. It's a way of spending time. This man taking on himself the vengeance of the Lord. Think the Lord cares much about what's happening up here tonight? You got to go there by yourself. Oh, you got to stand before your maker. You got to stand there by yourself. Nobody here can stand for you. Keep your chin up. You can only die once, son. <laughs>